So this presentation is um, naturally following on from another one that was given in the last session. So that was one quarter ago, three months ago. And um, that previous presentation was about the governance or the, the um, impending new governance regime around a series of Australian vocabularies uh, that deal with um, information about addressing. And the reason there's a governance challenge there is that the vocabularies, um, contributions to the vocabularies come from a, let's call it company A, uh, who discover term use in the, in the wild and they bring that into their database. Uh, but the actual authority of the code lists is conferred by another agency, a government agency set up to manage spatial information. So there's a, 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 um, a pattern here of information arriving that is unverified and then ultimately needing verification and, you know, massaging and so on. So there's a new governance regime being set up to deal with that. Um, and the code lists that we're talking about are those code lists, but we're not really going to talk about governance in this presentation. This is a, a technical presentation, essentially. Um, Okay, so uh, as it says there, we're talking about the vocabularies associated with the geocoded national address file, which I'll define in a second. And we're talking about a current technical SCOS vocab publication approach. So I'm, I'm gonna say this now and I'll say it again in the future. This is not the way to do everything for everyone. This is one method that we've implemented for this project for publishing vocabularies. And it's, it's definitely not appropriate in in some of the scenarios John and others are going to talk about, uh, but it's, it's one that we've found useful for a number of reasons. Okay. Outline. So what is the GNAF? I'll talk about that. I'll talk about a linked data version of it. I'll talk a little bit about the ontology and the vocabularies that we're using, some initial directions that we undertook, some final directions that we're implementing now. I'll talk about the publication mechanics, and I'll talk about future production. I've put a slide in there about governance, but it just says, see Joe, who's my collaborator. He'll talk, tell you all about the governance. Okay. So the GNAF. So what is the GNAF? So as it says there, it's, um, it's so PSMA is a government corporation whose job is to um, collect and distribute um, addressing information in Australia. And the GNAF contains all physical addresses in Australia and this is PSMA's own words, it's the most trusted source of foundational geocoded addresses for Australian business and government. Um, now, they've maintained this product, which they assemble from states and local councils and others for a few years. And uh, recently, um, the open GNAF has been delivered. Now, what's happened is the Australian government has essentially paid out uh, that company to make the data freely available in, a, in an open data sort of initiative. And they've put that database or that collection of data on the web and they update it every quarter. Um, now, the data is typically used as a giant Postgres database. It's got 13 and a half million addresses in it. And the addresses have got in the order of 20 statements of metadata about each one, something like that. Um, it's got hundreds of thousands of things that are not addresses in there, like street localities, localities, the Australian states, and so on. And it's got a whole pile of lookup tables. So the example there is the lookup table that tells you what type of address alias something is. So you've got two addresses. One is the alias of another. And how is it an alias? Well, it might be a synonym. It might be a so-called contributed defined alias, alternative locality, etc. Uh, arranged addresses where you've got a, a principal address with sub addresses, so units in a block, that sort of thing. Okay, now, uh, so many of these lookup tables are aligned to a standard, and that's the standard that needs to be governed. Um, and I mentioned at the beginning of this talk is governed, but not all of the uh, lookup tables are aligned. Um, and these may see use outside of this product. So some of, not so much the synonyms one I showed, but you know, address type and that sort of thing, they could be used elsewhere. And it's for this reason that we're publishing the vocabularies as something distinct from the product itself, from the actual 13 and a half million addresses. Okay, so in the last six months, Joe, who is the CTO of the company that produces the product, and I have worked on a linked data version of this database. It's online at the moment at gnaflldlinkdata.net. Uh, 
um, and it's soon to become an Australian government linked data working group uh, anointed or allocated data set. So what that will mean, we're not entirely sure, but almost certainly the URIs that we use um, for all of the components in the data set will be official government URIs and um, there'll be some registering of the data set and various other elements of it in Australian government work link data working group systems. So you'll be able to discover that there is such a, a data set as the GNAF link data version. So ontologies and vocabularies, the, the, the data model that the GNAF link data version actually delivers, um, it delivers a couple of different data models, but the primary one is defined in an ontology which very closely matches the, um, the database. Surprise, surprise. So what we've done is we've taken the database and we've said, what does an ontology version of that look like? And um, we've generated that and there's an API that actually delivers that content. And what you're seeing in that diagram there is just a very high level, main class level view of the, of the data model. So you can see from that that there's a class called an address and it can have an alias, um, it can have um, a geometry, um, addresses can be uh, within localities, etc., etc. So there's a few, not all the relationships in the ontology are listed there, but it gives you a feel for the kinds of things that are in this, this data set. So the GNAF also, so, so we've got, just to recap then, we've got the, the ontology that's delivered, that talk, that describes the data that's being delivered. We've got an API that actually delivers the data. And we've also got then code lists expressed as vocabularies delivered alongside. Um, so those code list terms or the vocabulary terms are both used in the data set and available for use outside it. And uh, I've just put a couple of arrows in there to show you that if you go to the website, you can see exactly where these things are. And then we'll probably click on those in just a minute. Okay. Um, oh, I made a spelling mistake there, but this implementation that we've got here is similar to other implementations where we have a, an ontology that describes something, in this case, everything you need to know about the GNAF's version of addresses, and then a series of code lists that um, are used with the ontology for various classification purposes. Okay, so the vocabularies themselves have a namespace that's an extension of the namespace of the ontology, so it's got a word code at the end, and you can see um, there the code list register um, has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten vocabularies. And by the by, the, the index that you're looking at there, which is a web page, is itself available in RDF and as a register, and you can actually navigate to all the code lists from the top level entry point of the API. Now, that's just for fun. Now, looking in one of the vocabularies, the initial direction was to say, well, we've got an ontology that talks about all the classes of things that we're interested in, and the vocabularies are essentially just subclasses. So, for instance, address type, um, we've got an address class, let's just have a whole pile of different subclasses of address, rural, rural block, rural cabin, urban, urban house, etc. Um, and Ontologically, this is fine. Um, it was very easy for me because I understand what an address is, or I, I, certainly what the data model thinks an address is. And I look at this code list that it uses for types of addresses, and I say these are all the subclasses of address. Easy enough. Um, and then we allocate those 13 and a half million individuals against one of those subclasses. Um, but it's very difficult for other people to use this um, because there's just not that much familiarity with OWL out there. Um, and there's little tooling that can really easily handle big collections of subclasses of things. Um, and I'll just, I'll come back to this, but there's also no practical reason not to use a more simple vocabulary in the end, something we discovered later on. So Rowan, who uh, of course is the secretary of this group, and I had some discussion about how we were doing something here that wasn't your normal, uh, and these are air quoted normal vocabularies, but in fact, a, an ontology which happens to include an awful lot of subclasses um, and in a hierarchy like you see over on the left there. Um, and we moved away from that and I'll describe that in a second. I'll just mention though that some of the code lists were lists of individuals, not classification classes. So for instance, the list of Australian states, there's six states in Australia, a couple of territories and a few other bits and pieces like a catch-all for all the addresses in Australia that are not in a state or a territory. 
the so-called other territories. Um, and those things are not classes, they are individuals. There is the state of New South Wales, not the class of things New South Wales. So that's just one distinction. So the later direction is to say, well, actually these collections, so the same structure that you see over on the left there of addresses and different types of addresses, we can just call that a Scots vocabulary and we can use it quite happily. Um, we can use it in conjunction with um, a, an OWL API that, uh, sorry, an OWL ontology that, um, that tells you where to use the classification thing, but we can also publish it just as a intellectual piece of work that says, these are the kinds of addresses that we know about in Australia. Um, and we've got tooling that supports uh, SCOS, you know, much more readily available than we have tooling that supports generic OWL. Um, and so, um, so this is one of the reasons for moving to that. These things are not mutually exclusive. We can have them um, as both OWL subclasses and SCOS things. And in fact, we do. But the important thing here is to say, despite me trying to do something difficult, I have gone back to fairly standard SCOS, which would keep Rob Atkinson happy for those who know him. Okay, um, now, this is a bit of a horrendogram, but it is the total publication process. And I'll just talk you through it because this is, the, um, this is what actually happens. And this is really where I wanted to go with this presentation is to talk through this. So over on the left, we have a database containing uh, vocab terms. And the reason is that the company that acquires the information from states encounters new vocab terms every now and then, and they put them in the database, and then they publish that database. Then I run a Python script, which takes chunks of vocabulary metadata, like the actual name of the vocabulary and things, reads the database and extracts a local vocabulary RDF file, a, you know, a SCOS file, um, from that, or makes, I should say, a file from that information. From there, three things happen. The first is that I take that RDF file and I manually publish it in the, uh, in the ANS, the Australian National Data Services Research Vocabularies Australia portal. Um, I just upload a new version uh, whenever I run the script and, and that automatically generates a SysVoc um, version of the data set, uh, sorry, of the vocabulary. The second thing I do is I take that local RDF file and I commit it to a remote GitHub repository for safekeeping. And I'll come back to that in a second. And the third thing uh, I do is I take that RDF file and I use another Python script with a bunch of HTML templates and I assemble per vocabulary, so 10 of them, an HTML file that presents that vocabulary in a fairly easy to use web way. And then I put that in GitHub. And then finally, I on the server that delivers the gnafld.net, so the data set, the API, the ontology, I pull that information down and, as static files of HTML and RDF. So that's the total publication process. So we end up with a copy of these things um, in uh, the latest version of a copy of these things in the ANS vocabulary portal, um, but the the actual visible delivery of the vocabs and even the RDF versions are all made available via this single web server and are not contributed to a pool of vocabularies elsewhere. Okay, so publication mechanics, the, the ontology, the GNAF ontology and the vocabularies are actually just a GitHub repository. And you can see a folder there called code docs. I think we might be missing one. <laughs> No, no, we're not in code. Code itself has all of the vocabularies. If I clicked on the code folder, you would see 20 files. You would see 10 RDF files and 10 HTML files, but they're all just sitting there. So this is you know, the management point, but the actual publication point is elsewhere. Okay, so last, we're getting towards the end folks. Um, so the vocabularies are published and each has its own URI. And now these URIs will change because we're gonna be using um, Australian government ones soon enough, but the mechanics are going to be the same. Um, so where we have slash def slash gnaf for the ontology, we have slash def slash gnaf slash code slash something or other for the various vocabularies. So you can see there's address types that are highlighted. Each vocabulary uses so-called hash URIs after that for the individual terms. So you can see the example there, address types has a rural unit within it, and you can get to that by just clicking on that address uh, there with the hash. Uh, so what this means, of course, is that whenever you resolve an individual vocabulary term, you get the entire vocabulary. 
not super super helpful for some applications, but reasonable enough for other um, for other uh, uses. And we'll see that in a second. Um, yes, so the whole vocabulary um, you can get either in HTML or in RDF, and there's some some content negotiation you can do to determine, and you can click on a link uh, to, to, to determine whether you want the human readable or the machine readable version. And finally, all the vocabularies are actually cached in a triple store uh, for cross vocabulary searching. Okay. So future production, um, we're going to automate some of the steps in that horrendogram that I showed you, but not all of them. Uh, the actual publication of the vocabulary versions is relatively infrequent and there's no real need to push automatically push versions to ands um, whenever we get a new one it happens yeah on a monthly sort of time step at, at the at the most um, we will update some of the git pushes so that when we commit files locally they'll just appear in the authoritative backed up repositories and so on now for governance ask joe this is my last slide, but I just wanted to quickly show you what this actually looks like online so that you can see that. And I want to hopefully click through this and see if I can actually show you what I'm doing. So I'm going to share my screen again and hopefully you will see a web browser. Okay, so you should see the meeting agenda again. Can someone nod if you can? Yes. Great, okay, here we go. So we've got a gnaf.net. NFLD, don't I? There's the uh, web page I showed you. The ontology is a very standard documented ontology with the diagram that I showed you. Going back one, we go to the GNAF codes. Here's the code index. Here's address types. And what you're seeing here is a very, very, very simple templated web page that has a, a little bit of information about the, so the concept schema bit of information about the collections that it contains. And then each term has a little chunk of information. So it tells you that it's a concept, what the, what the, uh, the label of the concept is, the URI, alternative labels for it, where the, what the source is. So not all of the terms come from the GNAF product description. Some come from elsewhere. And the contributor, which that's just my ORC ID in there. And the contributor is not the contributor of the term, but the, the contribution of this representation of it. And we've got some arguments about who exactly is sensible to put down as a contributor, but for the moment it's just all me until we come up with a better um, bit of metadata there. Uh, but the important thing is that to produce an HTML file like this, which um, works nicely per term, let me just, I'm just gonna scroll down. So let's just choose this term here, run that as a web, a web address. Oops. I'll go back up to the top, if I put that in, so hopefully you can see that what I'm putting in is that it's the web address of the, uh, the um, vocabulary with hash rural at the end, and we go straight to that term. So this is very easy for people to use. It's not rocket science stuff, but if you want to resolve the term as a human, you put it in the web browser and you get straight to the term. Um, if you do this as a machine and you ask for RDF, it's the same thing as clicking on, where is it? Up the top here, get me this vocabulary in RDF which if you click on that will download an RDF file. So you can't zoom into the individual term, uh, but you can download the vocabulary within which the term sits. So that's it, it's as simple as can be. Um, and as, a, as I've said, and I, and I promised I would say it again, this is certainly not what you would do for all vocabularies, but there's a reason that we're doing this here. And the reason is partly to do with the way terms are contributed. And at this point, at least, the branding of the vocabularies. They're all bundled up with the data set. They are themed in a very simple way. Um, they are simple vocabularies, there's hierarchies and so on there, but it's really each vocabulary is set up exactly the same with a single concept scheme, one or more collections, and then a set of, of concepts. Um, and uh, we're not using any fancy tooling, you know, management of the vocabularies is from database plus template file and a bit of, of scripting and so on. There's, there's, no, um, there's no fancy uh, vocabulary management tools there. The last thing I'll mention is that um, we are starting to get clients reading the vocabularies and doing other things with them. So in another database that's been set up to use some of this information, we're actually reading the vocab files and making database tables from them so that we can do vocabulary lookups in, against the database, which is much quicker than, than doing it against text files.